This is Do It For A Living, your source for inside information on the future of automotive performance. After the trip to SEMA, we realized how, again, how huge the market is and how much interest there will be in our car trailer. So we dropped 48 of the 50 products and just cut it out out of the range and totally refocused and, and got back on path we should have stayed on to begin with. What's holding you back from starting or growing your business into what it can be? Well, if you're listening to this, it's not a lack of information. What you're about to hear is all you need to get motivated and start making waves. Do It For A Living podcast details the journey of today's true players in their own words. Find out how they broke out so you can too. The time is now. The time is always now. Welcome back to another episode of Do It For A Living. I'm Todd Ersley with My Shop Assist, and today I've got Glenn Reed with me. Uh, he is the Managing Director of Futura Trailers and also the President of Futura Trailers here in the United States. Um, they are an innovative trailer company, and uh, you may have seen one of their videos on Facebook um, them loading up a really, really low Porsche. So they've got a interesting cable system that lowers the trailer down so you can get super low cars on there, which has been something that uh, is always a struggle for anybody that's got, you know, a race car or a splitter or something low. And so it's always a headache. So I've been following their product for quite a few years now. And then I finally met um, Glenn and his team at SEMA and then followed up with them in PRI. And then now we're uh, finally getting to talk, um, talk with Glenn about it. So um, Glenn, how are you doing today? I'm great. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks again for coming on the podcast with us. It was uh, worked out pretty well with you actually being in the States because uh, you guys' company is a New Zealand-based company, and then you being the president of the U.S. side, I'm guessing that you may spend quite a bit of time going back and forth. Yeah, we do, and it was an impromptu trip up here, so it worked out well. I had a meeting to get to uh, that was that just was thrown on me about two days before, <laughs> and um, so yeah, I jumped on a plane, and it was good timing. Wow, great. Yeah. So, um, you know, we'd like to hear, uh, you know, the background of your, you know, yourself and your company. Can you kind of run us through your background, you know, where you grew up and kind of what you did as a kid? Yeah, sure. I, I grew up in, in Auckland in New Zealand. Um, and my father was a, a trailer manufacturer. So he started the business before I was born. So I was sort of born into a trailer business um, back then uh, and, and grew up very much around trailers and boats and, and the business itself. Um, although he sold the company in the mid 80s, so right before I was sort of ready to leave school and would have potentially gone into the business, he he, uh, he sold it off and, um, you know, we, we my brother and, and, and I, we had to take, you know, traditional means of employment and, and <laughs> real jobs. <laughs> um, went out and got real jobs while we so his trailer company was it was it automotive transport or was it like shipping stuff? It was mainly uh, boat trailers would have been the biggest part and okay. cargo trailers. So yeah, part partly had had a hire division and a boat haulage division as well. So all of that combined, it was um, it was a rather large for New Zealand. It was a it was a big big business. Okay, very cool. And so did you? Uh, were were you at college when he ended up selling the business? Uh, no, I was in high school, um, and I was studying engineering and tech drawing and all those uh, things that you know school kids are into, and <laughs> yeah. it kept me interested and in, at school. And um, you know, I, I would muck around in the workshop in his workshop, and and I taught myself to weld and would make things, you know, trolleys and bits and pieces to play on. And uh, that that kind of got kept me interested in in the the uh, hand on building of things, and um, it was he he sold it um, probably at a, at the wrong time as far as we we're concerned, but it was <laughs> yeah. a decision that worked out worked out well anyway. So then, what was what uh, jobs did you get right out of high school then? Uh, I left in school and went into a construction company. Um, and took an interest in the the uh, building of commercial buildings. Um, wasn't residential, so we we were building. Um, well, that the first company I worked for, they were doing high-rise 
construction. So I learned all about the construction industry and and um, that eventually led to me having my own construction business, which was the direction I, I headed in for quite a number of years. And so was that in New Zealand as well? Started in New Zealand um, and then in my late 20s, I, I went over to Dubai and set up um, over there. Oh well, wow. so you've been uh, you've been working all over the world, then, huh? Yeah, I have. Yeah, that the um, that's where the the market was. Um, it was a really interesting uh, sort of startup company over there, which was very very challenging. And but it did, the the market was there. there was, they needed the product that I was producing in New Zealand, so I went to a bigger market, and um, you know it grew massively over about a ten year period. And what uh, what time frame was that? To uh, 98, 1998, and I, I came back home in late two thousand nine. Yeah, so <clears throat> I don't know too much about the Dubai economy, other than it always seems to be pretty lavish. Um, was that a, a high growth period for that for that country in that area? Yeah, it was indeed. It, it, it wasn't to begin with. It was um, a depressed market and economy from ninety eight to two thousand and three. But then the um, construction boom sort of took off, and we already had a, a, a bit of momentum, and um, we pretty much got on a on a wave, and uh, and you know we we grew flat out. It was it was an incredible experience. <laughs> yeah. So looking back, that was a good thing, huh? It was a good thing. It was it was um, very challenging though, and it didn't end well. So it, you know, made it um, it was sort of boom boom, boom to bust, bust huh? story as well. So yeah, not not all good news. So then, what uh, what was the next step after that? Did you did you move back to New Zealand to pick up construction again? No, I actually um, came to the states. With my young family, so I had had a one and two year old, and, and my wife who I'd met in the UAE, um, and we travelled around in a motorhome, and we were towing. So we we towed a vehicle from California to Alaska and all around the place for six months. So it was just just really time out. And uh, at that point, I you know I learned a lot about the US, um, the vehicles, um, the the trailering of vehicles. Uh, you know, just the lifestyle, the RVing was was a big part of it, obviously, and getting to see the country and and um, how people like to enjoy it. So we we were just amongst it, fully for fully immersed for about six months. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like quite the interesting, uh, I guess, pause on your professional career. Um, you know, lots of people talk about doing that, and I've even threatened to do that on multiple occasions, but. Uh, um, that probably was a pretty cool experience for your entire family to to kind of travel around and experience a new area for sure. Yeah, no, it certainly was an amazing experience, and and I always thought I'll I'll get back to New Zealand and and uh, in construction or start a construction business, but that the market had moved on quite a lot, um, and, and as far as um, the uh, the way they they built and um, what the type of buildings are building and mm -hmm. and it was also slightly, you know, it was very different to the to the Middle Eastern market, of course, but it, it wasn't really something that I was interested in anymore. So um, <clears throat> I didn't leap straight into construction. I made a made a decision that that's not what I wanted to do, and I wanted to just um, uh, get explore a, a more of a creative outlet and, and get into something new. So so we picked up um, really the trailer business again, um, where we would left off as kids or missed out on on a big part of it um and and started building trailers just just started off building like one trailer and and went from there so yeah kind of walk us through how that all started did you just kind of settle down in the states or did you go back to new zealand to start the company i went back to new zealand um and i was there just sort of mucking around in, in a friend's workshop um, we, I imported some motorbikes from the States that were damaged and just as a hobby really and I started fixing up motorbikes and, um, and I bought myself a little race car, um, to, just a little track car mm -hmm. and I needed, needed a trailer for one, I had an experience with a car when I was hiring a trailer and I ended up 
getting the the car stuck on the ramps at the track and okay, yeah. Uh, I, yeah at, at the top of the ramp so it wasn't a complete disaster I still got the car off but I was sort of thinking you know it kind of ruined the day a fair bit I didn't blame the trailer I blame myself but in the in the um the motorcycle um you know, hobby that I was doing I with these bikes that wouldn't run they were damaged bikes and I was wheeling them up a, a one particular bike I was wheeling it up a ramp onto a trailer and I nearly dropped it it was a, a big Harley mm-hmm. and I almost dropped the bike and and that's when I thought I'm going to build a trailer that, that the one I've always wanted to build it lowers to the ground and um, it's something I'd kind of thought about a lot uh, when I was a kid because I, I reckon I'd worked out a way to do it anyway so I just sat down at the on CAD and drew drew up a trailer and and made it and um, it worked. Oh, it took me about two weeks to design and then build and then you know have it operating and it. I thought this this thing's <laughs> incredible cool deal, and, huh? <laughs> and yeah, it's pretty cool and and uh, I'm going to get into building trailers, which uh, you know that was eight years ago now and and um, I would never have thought it took so long to 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 create a trailer business, but it but does and did. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's uh, pretty amazing how long some stuff takes to kind of mature into a steady state business phase. Yeah, it certainly does. You know, I, I pretty much said to, to myself and, and a friend of mine at the time that this is the way forward um, for trailers because this trailer dropped to the ground and it was just easy to use and, and it was really a great invention. Um, the thing that I didn't really... Well, I soon worked out was that they were expensive to make, so that made it really hard to, to turn into a business. Yeah. So the uh, the the first trailer that you made, sorry to interrupt real quick, but the the first one that you made was it the same design that you guys still use today? Uh, no, it's the same principle. Um, it, we're we're on our third generation of trailer design now, and um, so there was a series of of builds. Um, and innovations that improved the trailer as we went. So we, we started with a very manual trailer that you could you could like raise and lower by hand, like the motorcycle version, okay. you could yep. do it by hand. Um, and it had a small manual winch on it as well to lift the heavier uh, items in small cars. But when, as soon as we got into a tandem trailer, that, that trailer was no longer, that design was no longer suitable to be a tandem axle. So I had to change it. Um, and that, that was really an innovative leap that I got quite excited at that point. Um, we went to an electric winch to, to raise the trailer with a wireless remote control and we tripled our sales just, uh, you know, in, in one year, just basically started to take off. So yeah, it opened uh, up, a, opened up another market for you. Yeah, it did. It became a lot more interesting. Um, at the same time, we, we, videos ended up on YouTube and um, Facebook and you know people started sharing the video and thought these these are cool check this out so inquiries you know started coming in and it, and it really um, it, it didn't really grow the business at that point it, it, it did improve considerably in New Zealand but it was still an expensive trailer to make being uh, you know basically handmade out of steel and um, you know, cutting and welding and all the rest that goes on a typical trailer manufacturing. So it wasn't the, the final product, which, which we have now, which is aluminum, but that, um, that was another another part of the process of growing that business. Um, to get into the to the United States, we, we changed the product um, entirely, really. So that's our generation three that we're on now. Yeah, so can you kind of explain the mechanism, um, if you can, without being able to use a drawing, um, of like mm. how it raises and lowers? Because there's a, you know, the the tilt back trailer is pretty common for construction sites, but it's a steep angle of attack. Um, and then there's there's other kind of roll back trailers that will roll back and then they tilt down, so it just kind of raises or it uh, moves the rotation point forward, but. You guys went about it um, totally different. So, can you kind of explain how the trailer works, and you know how you're able to get it so low? Sure. The um, probably the 
the easiest way to explain it is rather than having a fixed or li a live axle that travels from one side of the trailer to the other and uh, has, has nowhere to go, we, we have swing arms. So we still have an axle and at the end of the axle we have a swing arm which can rotate up and down. Uh, so that's that's the um, that's the innovative part or the way it's built. Uh, and then the raising and lowering is, is done with a lifting arm which sits over the top of the swing arm and you you lift lift the trailer by pulling that lifting arm down with a, with cables and an electric winch. Yeah, so it's just got a winch at the front that you just turn on and off, right? Yes. Or go one direction or the other to raise and lower it? Yeah, it's really simple um, to, well, when you look at it, when people look at it, they, they admire how this, how simple it is and, and how sort of robust and it is. And it's not made out of a whole lot of crazy parts. It's it's trailer parts and, you know, it's it's really straightforward. But, of course, it was um, not easy to to design and make simple, but it, it just is simple and it works really well. So that's been um, really been the recipe, or one of the recipes to success. <laughs> yeah, um, help the simplicity, out, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, so uh, when you first started, you were in New Zealand and you were making the motorcycle trailer. Um, what or how did you go about expanding the market to Australia and the United States because that's I know that's those are two the two main places that you sell the trailers so what what does it take to to get that infrastructure set up you know if in the like in the beginning did somebody from the United States order a trailer from you and then you just had to figure out how to get it to them or can you kind of walk us through how you did that yeah uh, well I it wasn't that way it was actually I, I wanted to enter the US market being obviously the biggest market probably globally be the biggest trailer market and um, there's we we determined what our target market was which being the car or mainly you know your race race drivers or track day enthusiasts um, so this is a huge market so I just came over to the market and had a look and um, you know, uh, arranged a, a trip to SEMA which um, I wanted to go to anyway and I got all, all excited that I was going to SEMA and I was going to be back the next year with a with our trailer. Um, so I, I came over and, and visited some, you know, friend, friends of a friend and um, he told me a lot about the trailer market here and, and gave me a lot of examples and, and I quickly realised how inexpensive trailers are in the u.s market so it wasn't going to be easy and um <laughs> yeah because you can yeah, pick up I, like you know a basic utility trailer for a thousand dollars you know with yeah. ramps you know it'll work but it's not made for yeah. race cars no that's right so i i was i went back home with my tail between my legs a little disappointed that i thought you know what was going to be our trailer that we already had would would somehow export it um so that wasn't the case, um, I, I uh, pretty much had to go back to the drawing board and, and go for, I knew I couldn't get my price down to where it needed to be to compete with the ordinary um, ramp trailers, steel trailers and the like. So I um, developed the, the aluminum one and I basically went for the best quality and the best products that we could find um, for the right price or given that the market was going to be much bigger we, we were able to um to go for volume production and we were able to produce a, a way better trailer than the one we have now compared to the steel one but we could make it for the same price uh we could sell it for the same price so when, once i'd achieved that and and made um prototypes and started using them in new zealand they they ended up on, on facebook and I, and I took orders from the US, so um, we, we we ended up with US customers, and and we entered the market. We, we formed the company and exported, and um, personally delivered the first dozen trailers to to US customers across the United States. <laughs> so did you just you know stick them in a shipping container and ship them all over, and then you personally picked them up when they when they hit yeah. the states? That's right. Yeah, we we. Um, loaded uh, 12 into a container and um, it, they were all knocked down the wheels off mm -hmm. etc and, and we shipped them over to, to Long Beach in California met the container there um, 
we had sort of developed this system of some brackets and things to bolt them together. So we, we repacked them into a stack and the bottom trailer, we, we licensed the bottom trailer and then we towed it on the road with five <laughs> on top of it. trailers stacked on top and that was behind our RV. So we, we bought a motorhome, um, built the stack. We bought a car that we needed to get around and we put a tow hitch on that. It's actually a Ford Mustang, so it has a tow hitch on it. Yep, we on the towed two trailers. <laughs> oh, behind it, huh? <laughs> behind. We towed trailers of the Mustang and the RV. We we got we offloaded the first five in, in California, and then we, we took seven trailers right across to North Carolina, um, delivered a couple on the way, and then uh, offloaded the, the rest in North Carolina. Had a couple of customers there, and we sort of we distributed them personally to the to the first owners. That's uh, quite yeah, so. quite a bit of red carpet service for the initial investors, huh? The, the uh, yeah. early adopters. Yeah, it wasn't really the reason we did it. It was um, we wanted to work out how to do it. So yeah. we we didn't do the traditional find a trailer dealer and sell to them and let them deal with it. We we needed to do it ourselves. So we knew how the how the system would work and how the dealers could do it in the future. And um, we also got to test the trailer um, on the road. So we had you know fully loaded stack, which was at the maximum weight that it can carry mm -hmm. and dragged it 5,000 miles around the state. So that was really good, good test and um, demonstration of how we can easily unload the stack and get it out to the customer and uh, in good shape. And you know, it worked out. That's sort of how we, that is how we deliver to, to this day as well. Yeah. So, um, do you have dealers in the States now that, you know, keep some trailers or, you know, yeah. Like can, if somebody orders a trailer now, um, how are they getting it to their house? Yeah, we, we, we have dealers now. So we, 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 um, we have a few dealers. We have around 12 or 14 dealers and we're increasing that all the time so they now order the the pack the uh a dozen trailers off um normally made up of three stacks of four trailers so mm -hmm. they go to their yard and they unpack them and the customer will pick up from them or they'll deliver from there so but we have to sh east coast to texas and california so they still have to go out of those three points to the dealer so they still have to get there by road so it's the same system but it's just there is now a dealer in between and they, they deal with the customer. Gotcha. And so how do you how do you decide or pick on the dealers or are they like existing trailer companies that are interested in your product and then reach out to you guys? Uh, that, that's been interesting. We've had um, the initial uh, first dealers were car dealers. Um, so I'm actually at a car dealership now, our West, West Coast Corvettes, where they, they sell our trailers and um, they chose our trailer for themselves, mm -hmm. uh, for the dealership here. And they they just recognize straight away that this is a product they want to want to sell. Um, and, yeah, and then they, they, they can offer that to their customers. You know, they're yeah. the guys that buy Corvettes for fun racing stuff they say hey you can buy one of these trailers and you can load it up yeah. in a minute <laughs> yep that's exactly what happened and so we had that happen uh, all across the country we, we had car dealers um so large chevy gmc dealers um you know north carolina virginia um pittsburgh there's there's, there's others as well that they, they just recognize that there's a margin in a trailer and the trailer suits their customer base they already have and um they're usually into racing themselves which which mm -hmm. certainly helps uh and and it's so it's been different to your normal model but we also have trailer dealers that are traditional trailer dealers but we try and um approach or uh, the ones that may be near a racetrack or um have an interest in motorsport uh, that definitely helps yeah because then they take the car their car out and sell your product for you and then they're going to sell exactly. it <laughs> they're going to get a commission on the sale yeah, yeah exactly yeah they they uh, they use it the, the the ultimate um dealer for us races himself and ha uses our trailer and and then his friends buy them and then you know you you basically they fall in love with the product and then they the product starts selling itself so that's um that's how how it works best 
So along the the process of developing this business and releasing the trailers, um, you know, worldwide, essentially, um, was there ever a, po a moment that you kind of doubted yourself and you were like, man, I don't know if this business is actually going to take off? Um, yeah, yeah, there, there was. Um, certainly in the early days when we didn't really have a, we didn't determine what our focus was as far as customers went. So we, we began building motorcycle trailers and a, and a car trailer. And in New Zealand, the typical trailer manufacturer will build any type of trailer for anyone. They don't focus on a particular type. So we ended up with 50 different trailers in our range from. Oh my gosh. <laughs> uh, yeah. Ordinary garden trailers that tilt trailers, even um, the occasional trailer with ramps. Uh, we did rubbish tip trailers, all, all kinds of things. And it became quite quite distracting. And it, it looked like uh, we, we were just a small New Zealand engineering business that built trailers. Mm -hmm. And uh, that it was often hard to pay the bills and just keep keep it going. And um, it was really a, a, a loss of focus or what, what, we, what we started the business for. We'd, we'd forgotten what it was about. Um, so after the trip to the to SEMA, um, we realized how, again, how huge the market is and how much interest there will be in our car trailer. So we dropped 48 of the 50 products and just cut it out, out of the range and totally refocused and, and got back on, on the path we should have stayed on to begin with. So you, you zeroed in on the things that you're passionate about and the things that make money and kind of simplified the business. Yeah. So what, when we were having, I'll be having doubts about the business. Um, yeah, you just come back to the, to the start. Why, what, what's the best part? What, why do, why do we do it in the first place? And, and, um, found that passion again. And, you know, then, then would have, uh, a customer or some, someone important or, or someone that we thought was, was a significant, um, person in the market or a celebrity, for example, they buy a trailer and, and then the excitement's, it's all on again, you know, it's, it's just, uh, really, um, fuels the passion. Yeah. So what, uh, what's something that you've got going on right now that, you know, you're really fired up about? Yeah, there is. So there's, there's a few new products. Um, the, the most exciting one at the moment will be our enclosed trailer that we, we, uh, we're developing, which is a fairly revolutionary enclosed trailer. It's not just your regular um, enclosed race car trailer. It obviously lowers to the ground, but it also, um, is lightweight and you can open up the sides. So it has a, innovative uh, curtain side type arrangement that we're developing and um that to us is, is really exciting with uh from a business point of view there's probably more enclosed race car trailers out there than open ones so, and this will basically do both It'll, you can open up your trailer so you can access the car and tie it down and climb in and out of it easily but then you can close it all in and and um get it out of the weather and and uh, off to the racetrack so that's exciting. Um, and we also are working on a partnership to manufacture in the US, which is why I'm here this week. Um, <laughs> that, that's, um, that's, that's a good, a good thing. Yeah. Actually, both of those were questions that I was going to ask you if you, uh, yeah. <laughs> had plans to do an enclosed trailer. Cause, um, it, it looked, you know, the two that you offer are both, they're just open trailers, which is, you know, which is fine. But if you're, you know, a lot of the people, they don't want you know, they don't, they want the security of the enclosed trailer and the, you know, not having people see it. And then you can carry all of your tools inside and every, all your spares and everything. So yeah, I was curious to know if you guys had found a way and I'm just thinking in my head, you know, it, it's the fenders is where it gets really weird. So, uh, mm. I'll be really curious to see, you know, what you guys have come up with, um, you know, what, what you guys have come up with to kind of get around that. <laughs> so, um, what, what a kind of expected date are you looking for or shooting for to have that, to release either some, some simulations of it or an actual product? Uh, we'll, we'll have an actual product at SEMA. So that'll be in November. Um, we should, well, we will definitely have it in the market before then in, in New Zealand anyway, we'll be, um, once we do the initial prototypes and testing, we, we, uh, we'll get it in the market and, and we will, we are taking orders um, shortly, so there'll be um, 
images and simulations coming out. But that's um, it is based on our original, our current chassis anyway. So it's mm -hmm. actually an accessory that attaches to the chassis. So if the, anyone's got an open trailer now, they'll be able to add that to it. And oh, it so they can retrofit amount. their current trailer, yeah. huh? Yeah, that's right. So it's really a covered trailer more than it's not a, a full enclosed race car trailer that you carry a lot of stuff. The the idea is that it's um, still lightweight. You can tow it behind an SUV. Uh, it fits fits your race car, your tires, maybe your fuel, and the rest of the equipment if you need any goes in the tow vehicle. Okay. Yep. Which is really our target market. Um, and also it'll uh, it, there's there's a demand for the towing industry with, with guys yeah, and um, they, vehicle transports transporters. Yeah, and they um, they don't do enclosed towing. So, well, they do, but it's it's um, just your traditional enclosed trailer with ramps, etc. And we're offering a, a far better solution to uh, for roadside recovery with an enclosed low loader trailer that's quick and easy to use and lightweight mm -hmm. and all the rest of it. So that that's um, yeah, there's a the market will just um, be much much bigger for us. Very so uh, we're yeah, it is it is cool, but it also means. Um, manufacturing in the US is is really the next step so that's the other exciting thing that's happening at the moment yeah so uh, before we get into that let's uh, pause real quick for a, a short break we all know owning a shop is difficult so we created my shop assist to help you manage the various jobs whether you run a machine shop a performance tuning shop build off-road trucks or even do powder coating my shop assist can help you it is completely online and will help you schedule the jobs, log time on each task, track parts orders, and take pictures of the work. You can even export your jobs from My Shop Assist into QuickBooks as invoices. So if you're interested to improve operations at your shop, check out MyShopAssist.com to start your 30-day free trial. Okay, so we're back with Glenn Reed of Futura Trailers. And uh, can you tell us about the business itself? So... Do you have like a, a headquarters manufacturing facility and where is it located? Yeah, we, we have our headquarters in, in Auckland, New Zealand, and uh, that that is a not a huge manufacturing facility. We hire we have about 14 staff at the moment. Um, we mainly we do uh, assembly of trailers there. So our parts we now have we outsource all of our part manufacturing. So there'd be uh, you know, quite a lot more people involved in producing our trailers in the 14, but um, that's uh, enabled us to to um, build a facility that can be easily replicated, and, and that's uh, what we're, we're about to, to do in the U.S. Okay, so you have, uh, you know, job shopper manufacturing facilities that are cutting the channels and, you know, a, you know, fabricating all of the pieces and then you guys do the final assembly that's right so we we've um with the aluminum we we don't we're not an aluminum company ourselves so we outsource the, that um where we have our own extrusions and our own um, material that's specific to to the trailers and uh the, the factory that builds them is, is an un, unlimited capacity yeah com compared to you know what we would be able to do so and that They've got the best machinery and all the rest of it. So we, we um, purchase our trailer chassis from them and all our steel parts, they're laser cut on tube lasers and, and robot welded and hot dip galvanized and all these processes we don't need to do ourselves. There's, there's companies out there doing it. So we, we're able to outsource uh, pretty much everything is outsourced and we, we, we assemble so our trailers are the, the school level for assemblies lower so we're able to maintain you know keep staff mm -hmm. uh, e easily we don't we don't have a really high school level although we we, we we look for certain attributes in the person that you know they may have never built a trailer before but they they got the right attitude and so we're we're able to um, you know grow yeah, it you... quite if we need a PhD type person we hire those services for that particular job and um you know just consultants or, or what have you mm -hmm. so yeah it's it's really um really easy easier that way so with you having an engineering and construction background did you do the actual design of the the current trailer 
Yeah, I, I did. I, I designed pretty much every part. Um, and I use uh, SolidWorks, so 3D modeling engineering software. Uh, so I, I had to learn how to do that and um, design it. And then after the design was as good as I thought I could get it, I employed a, an aircraft engineer to to help with the analysis of the trailer. And you know, he spent a couple of months actually analyzing and simulating the the, um, the trailer in use. And um, you know, we refined the design. It took 18 months to design the chassis, uh, and then we when we we brought it out. It went straight on the road, and you know, it just works because it's already been simulated and tested. Uh, yeah, so that's with software. Uh, that's quite a bit of overhead and and uh, monetary investment for a yeah. year and a half to develop and manufacture a trailer. So, did that include making the first one, or was that really just the design and testing phase? Uh, no, that that included making. So we we designed for probably six months of design uh, then you 3d print parts to t take a look at them uh, then i spend time at the factory and we build build the chassis meanwhile we built prototypes in steel and uh, so we could use all the componentry all the axles and everything which is steel anyway um, we were using them on our tra trailers that we were we were selling into the market so we, we got to test those then sell those before the aluminum chassis was even ready. So then it was really just a case of bolting the aluminum chassis, and you know, and bringing it into the production line. And and um, we knew everything else already worked and was well proven. So it was really a, a step by step process to transition over to a better product. And so, how many um, how many owners are there in the company? Uh, just my brother and I own it and uh, he he runs the operations side mainly internationally so he does a lot of traveling um he's back in the factory f a fair bit as well so he's b he's back in ford and, and all around the globe actually he's off to spain tonight and you have time in europe as well so <laughs> you know he yeah he, he's all over the place yeah so it sounds like you guys are traveling all the time um, are these all, you know, trying to, to drum up more business and get more dealers and, you know, sell more trailers, or are you looking out for maybe investors or somebody that wants to help you expand the business? Um, the, the past two years I've spent traveling, uh, this, the U S, um, and it is, uh, meeting new customers and promoting the trailer. So we, we attend a lot of shows and events, but the good thing about it is, um, I've I've been fortunate enough to be able to travel with my family, so they come with me. We'll spend three months at a time traveling on the road, attending events and uh, being together. So it, it's just um, it's just like the dream job. While we're doing that, uh, then we head back home. Meanwhile, the business is still operating. So I have have a couple of managers, or you know, we have quite a few actually that are sort of managing the business. And growing the business while I'm away, and so I'm learning more and more about the market and the customer by being here. So we we're, we're, we usually spend a lot of time in in the market in the U.S. and um, and you also get the opportunities arise by being here. So you mentioned investors; um, they kind of come come about because we we meet people and uh, they like the business. So we, we're always talking to people that want to invest in the business so it's um it's an interesting part of the process but at this point we haven't haven't taken on any any investors but it, it's certainly um you know it's on the on the cards to do so at some stage yeah always always leave it as a possibility huh yeah because we're constantly growing and changing and improving and adding value so you know the longer we are able to do it ourselves the better and you know that's it may be ultimately what happens. Um, it's hard to know, but it, it's really um, it's about enjoying it as much as doing it. So we we do it because we enjoy it. And and if you're not enjoying it, you know you you, you need to change. Maybe not what you're doing, but just uh, educate yourself on or learn something that that makes a subtle change in the business that then you're enjoying it again. So as long as you're enjoying it, you know I think it's it's success.
Yeah. So um, talking about the management, you know, while you're gone, was that something that was difficult to kind of relinquish, you know, to give up the power of managing the business? Or did you just sit back and say, if I want to make this successful, I need to be selling. So I need to give up these things or, or was it like, I don't really want anybody else running this business. Uh, no, I, I want someone else running the business. I, I don't want to run the business as such. Um, I want to work on the business and not in it. So that, that is, it's not been um, hard to give up at all. Um, it's it's hard to to um, to find the right people is hard, but um, probably because I'm not a great manager myself, I'm more, more of an entrepreneur. So I find management of people and training is just not one of my expertise and there's better people at it than me. So we kind of, uh, I, I'm like, yeah, just, just do it. Just, just get on with it. That's always <laughs> yeah, my yeah. attitude. Yeah. And my brother's attitude. And, and we find it frustrating when it's not just happening because it's not as easy as we think it, it is, but we just, uh, we, we give our staff, uh, yeah, they, they can pretty much feel like they own that business because we're, we're not there a lot. Um, and they, they, they run, run it day to day. And, um, you know, we're, we're in contact constantly, of course, but, it's um, we give them a lot of freedom to to do it their way. So we try and hire the expertise and and let them you know let them get on with it. So it seems to be working. Yeah, that's uh, I think that's a pretty rare trait. Um, probably something that's common with successful business people is being able to give up some responsibility and trust others. But um, I'm impressed mm. that you know you were able to see that um, pretty early on and then be able to you know find people that you trust to help, you know, make the business more successful. Yeah, no, we're fortunate um, that there's people that want to go to the, go and do that job and, and um, be a part of it. it, it it's something I learned in the Middle East, you know, we grew that business to 700 employees and you just couldn't manage them all. And um, I pretty much work on my own and rely on others to manage those people. So, you know, I'll, um, Obviously, I have my team, and we work together. And then, um, you know, they just got to get on with their jobs and the things they enjoy and are good at. And I leave them, leave them to it. And you know, I have some fairly high expectations, um, which, but we're all aware of what they are, and they're, they're just, you know, goals and objectives of the company. So they just get on with it. Nice. Um, yeah. So going back and talking about manufacturing here in the United States. Um, that to me seems like it'll be an enormous cost savings of shipping. Um, at least you can manufacture them here, but, um, has that been something that you've wanted to do for a while? And then how are you going about setting up a new manufacturing facility for the business? Yeah, it is something we've always wanted to do. Uh, makes sense that it's made in the country where they, when they, they're sold. Um, and it is really, we designed that the trailer as an American, product so it should be made here um, so it really was um, a, a case of uh, by chance you, you know we, we we started with the right people in shipping and that uh, shipping of our trailers or receiving importing our trailers for us and they've you know been stuck with us um, from the beginning as a small importer and probably a, a bit of an bit of an annoyance because a bit different to <laughs> yeah. what they normally do they normally deal in cars they normally export cars and we're <laughs> importing trailers so uh but they saw i think right away that that, that there's potential and they've stuck with us and now we're, we're partnering looking at partnering anyway and and a um in a manufacturing uh, facility if you have all of the cad drawings is that just something that you'll be able to train pretty easily to just ramp up the manufacturing here yeah it'll be a staged process so we will start by exporting all the parts from new zealand to to the us and um and assemble so we'll just take a part of our assembly plant and replicate it over here uh, then we can add more parts um, more assembly and and manufacturing of those parts in the us as well if it uh, makes sense economically and if which I'm, I'm sure it will. Uh, it's just a, a case of we're not going to start everything at once. We'll we'll start with the, the, the bulk assembly, and that'll cut down on a lot of the shipping costs and 
and uh, it'll mean the stock's readily available in the US and the, the lead times will come down and the cost may come down. Um, it it pr probably won't. We, we think that, you know, there'll be, for example, there's import duty on trailer parts, whereas there isn't importing duty on trailers. Oh, so there's already, a, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So there's some additional costs there and there'll be another overhead of another facility. So, but it will, it will enable us to grow. So that, that's the, the, the mate, one of the major benefits. And we'll have okay. staff here on the ground in the US full time. Full time sales staff and support and everything. Yeah. Yeah, because I would, I would guess you could fit a hundred trailers worth of parts into the space that you're fitting, like twelve trailers or or eighteen mm. trailers or however many you're actually sending, because you can actually pallet all the pieces up and just fill that container as as high up as you can with yeah. dense space instead of assembled space. Yeah, that's right. And our our uh, some of our parts are made overseas anyway, so they ship to New Zealand and and it can just ship direct to to the states. Mm -hmm. So with all the travel that you're doing, how are you dealing with the time changes? Has your body just become accustomed to, you know, switching time <laughs> zones frequently? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no it's, a, it's it's still it's not too bad. You get fairly used to it and um uh the time change from New Zealand to the US is only a few hours, so it's not not that hard and it's a 12-hour flight it's through the night and you know we I have uh, some uh, noise cancelling headsets, which make a huge difference. So you can actually sleep on the plane. And um, no, it's, uh, I normally get here and get straight into it. Yeah, that's pretty. That's pretty good. I was just curious about that with all the travel that uh, because I just drive everywhere. So it's like you know I'll get two hour time difference maximum in a day's drive. So, mm -hmm. um, but I would imagine going all over the world or the, you know, back and forth would be a little hectic, but yeah, if you're getting the, the nighttime flight, um, and then just sleeping on the plane, you, you get there and you're just kind of ready to go. Yeah. It's easier than the driving. Um, we, I do a lot of driving in the States as well in, in the RV and, you know, you'll drive 10, 12 hours and, um, you you don't feel you've done much because you're sitting in the chair <laughs> just, just sitting, yeah. driving, but you're yeah. super tired. It really is really taxing. Whereas on a flight, you know, I work, I generally um, catch up on my design work and I'll work on a business plan or whatever. And then I might watch a movie, you know, have something to eat, go to sleep. Mm -hmm. It's actually quite relaxing to fly and no one can bother you. So I enjoy flying. Briefly mentioned the business plan. Is that is that something that you guys have a formal um, business plan and maybe some targets and goals that you set periodically? Yes, yeah, definitely. It's um, been quite a key part um, of growing the business is to having a plan. And um, even though we don't refer to it very often, it generally, I find if you've written it down, it generally comes true. It generally happens, uh, which is quite amazing how it seems to work. But, um, you know, so we have now, we have uh, a more formal business plan and um, uh, we we refer to that if if in doubt we just go back to the plan if it wasn't in the plan you know we, we don't don't do it or we, we can change the plan so so, so uh, but it's definitely uh, we definitely have one yeah it's going to be you know kind of interesting to see you know is is one of the plans to get the manufacturing facility up and running this year or is that something you're shooting for 2019 uh, no, it's this year. So we we loosely thought it would happen last year, um, though we had some changes in the in our company structure. So we kind of delayed it, and um, for a while there, we thought, oh, let's go down this investment um, route and build a facility and go, you know, go this way. But then mm -hmm. we you know, we we just sort of referred back to the plan. No, that's not what we plan to do and we just delayed it a few months and uh, so an opportunity has presented itself and, and um, you know it was in the plan so we explore it and you know we, we start investing time and money and effort and flights and whatever coming over and getting on with it so yeah that was that that is in the plan it's just like the products the, the products are in the plan um, our objectives or the, the goals the targets are we're going to plan how we're going to achieve them. We try and plan, but yeah, it yeah. doesn't. Yeah. Yeah, you try it's the best just, you can. It's a, it's an exercise in thinking, 
you know, if you don't make it, that's okay. But at least you, you were thinking about it and you can, you move in that general direction. So, um, with the trailers, you know, so you've, you make two actual, like different trailers, a single and a dual axle. Are you going to be making, uh, to me, the, the dual axle one seems to be the trailer. Um, mm. it, are you selling very many of the single axle one anymore? And, you know, are you thinking yeah. of transitioning that one out or is that still a, a big, a big market for you? Uh, 20% of our trailers are single and, and 80 are tandem. So there's still a market for them. Um, and there's a, uh, when they become enclosed, there's a, a, a new, new market as well, mm -hmm. like in motorcycles and, um, smaller, smaller cars. So the small classic cars are what they're for. And so, yeah, there's, there's still a market and I don't think we'll, we'll ever stop building those, but you know, the, the dual axle is the, the biggest seller. We're actually about to do a triple axle as well, which uh, is a, a special project we're doing with Mad Mike. <laughs> really step up, step up the uh, um, capacity, then, huh? Yeah, this, this um, drifter Mad Mike. He's he's ordered one for himself, and it's it's um, typical of him. It has to be quite unique and special. So it's triple okay. axle. It's longer and wider, and carries two cars or a car and a side by side. So just it is a custom one-off but it may become a product we sell as well yeah. but yeah if it, if it utilizes a lot of the same products um that seems to make sense but yeah i that would that'll be pretty cool whenever he gets gets that trailer i want to see it yeah how are you promoting your business um both like actively and then just organically uh we do um a lot of uh well shows we attend shows we we're constantly on line advertising and we haven't done a lot with facebook um, we we do run some facebook ads but we've just started doing we just appointed a, a company to help us um promote and grow that because we we're not experts in it so we've hired someone mm -hmm. uh, so we there is an area there um we we do magazine advertising um and then we we uh require our dealers to promote as as best they can as well and we assist them wherever we can so we have quite a this year anyway we have a substantial marketing bu budget where we're reinvesting um, profits really and into into marketing and and that's um you know we're fast becoming a marketing company as well as a trailer <laughs> building company so yeah what uh if you don't mind me asking what percentage of revenue goes towards the marketing budget uh, we're about 3%. Okay. Yeah. We just had a, a high end wheel manufacturer and he does 5%. And yeah, it's, it's amazing. I, I thought the numbers would be a little higher, but you know, it is, you are spending a lot of money on marketing. Um, yeah. cause it, that's the most important way to transition to sales. If that's the market you're shooting for. So have you found that word of mouth, you know, is better or are you getting people, visiting your website from, you know, the Facebook ads or the YouTube videos or the magazine ads, um, to purchase trailers. Yeah. I think it's a combination of all of those things the, the, the website is, um, is, is the focal point. You, you bring people to the site, but to get them mm -hmm. there, you do through a number of different ways, but from there, they then get a feeling of well, who we are and what, what we do and then how to buy a trailer or how to find a dealer. But um, I think word of mouth is a good one, and the trailer speaks for itself. So if you see it at the track and in use, and you get to talk to the owner, and you have a need for a trailer, you're gonna you're gonna get one of these if you if you you know if you really can afford it or if that's what you want. But um, so they sell the trailers for us. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that that's really the thing. The best thing about the product is it it multiplies itself. Uh, yep. Then yep. of course. They need to have seen it somewhere else as well, or um, seen it in a magazine, see it on Facebook, know about it, be comfortable that it's a product that exists in the market. And then, um, you know, we've managed to uphold a good reputation and uh, that, that all helps as well. So, you know, the, the buying then generally comes down to whether they have a, have a need or, and can afford to buy it and when they want it and um, it seems to be working. Yeah, and I mean, I've 
I've done what little I could <laughs> to help as well. Like the, the word of mouth is to me the most important thing. And that has held true, um, with our, with our project management software as well. That, you know, if, if I can get somebody to tell another shop owner that it's a good product, then I have a better chance of closing that sale. Um, but yeah, I had a, you know, I had a buddy here in Dallas that he's got a really lowered, um, BRZ, with the splitter on it. And I had loaned him my conventional steel car trailer that I've been able to get lowered cars on, but he, you know, we put ramps under his rear wheels of his Tahoe and then I've got long ramps. And then we even put boards on top of that and he still couldn't get that thing on the trailer. And so, um, you know, I had mentioned to him a while back, I was like, man, you got to look at these trailers, <laughs> these Futura trailers. And he ended up getting one and it was just like, he was just amazed at, you know, how much struggle he had tried to get, it on a conventional trailer. And then he's like, you know, just in seconds, he can have it loaded up on the car. So yeah, the product really does speak for itself. And, um, you know, getting, getting that notoriety and the, you know, people talking about your product and, mm -hmm. you know, just recommending it, uh, really goes a long way yeah. um, in, in pushing the business forward. Yeah. Thank you for helping us with that. So it, 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 <laughs> yeah. um, it reminded me of, uh, we, we were really, uh, privileged to be able to sell the trailer to Alansa and uh, for their museum and and I, I met Al Unser Jr. at a show, um, introduced myself and he saw what I was doing and checked out the trailer and he got, well, there's a video of, of him telling this on our website, but he phoned his dad and said, you need, you really need to check out this trailer and, yeah, and uh, yeah. they, he, he did and, and they ordered one. They've actually just received their second trailer. And they absolutely love it. And they, they've got those really wide, low Indy cars in the museum mm -hmm. full of vehicles. And, and um, you know, that was that was the best uh, endorsement that we could ever get. And it was um, and it was a real genuine thing. You know, we, we didn't pay them to say what they said or anything. They 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 bought the trailer and um, they love it. And, you know, we, we hear about it a, a lot. Um, and. And it's it's really really good that people love our product. I think that's what makes the whole business enjoyable and successful. That the product is something people want and desire, and and, um, and you know we try and make the best of that for the for the person, the end user. So they they, they should um, we try any way to that they enjoy the whole experience of um, purchasing, receiving, and then using the trailer. And then using it, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I guess that's something I never really thought about is like the real, like a real race car, like a purpose built race car, you know, whether it's a classic or a newer one, they were always transported in semi trucks that had, you know, uh, the, the loading decks, I guess. So as long as you could get it over like a two inch hump, you could get it inside. Mm. Um, but that is not the case when you've got to be moving these cars around and not have a semi truck transporter yeah. with you. So that's, that's pretty cool. Yeah. It's an area that we're picking up where people are actually tired of the big transporters or the big enclosed and they just want to go to the track for an afternoon and keep it simple and, and that that is really our target market so how many hours do you think you spend a week uh working on the business um pr probably about 60 hours um i mean I'm, if you ask my wife she'd just say all the time but i try not <laughs> yeah. to to me work is when I'm on my computer or looking at the screen, that's working, and that that's a part that I don't spend 12 hours doing. And you know, when I'm at home, I get told off if I'm doing too much of that. As so, but the thought that goes into it and the communication with others, um, you know, you know that that definitely uh, consumes you know all of all of my time pretty much. Um, so I, I don't do other activities at the moment. Um, I don't race or do anything like that anymore. It's all, it's all business, but it is, um, it is a pleasure as well. I really, really enjoy it. So I, I, it doesn't, to me, it's not work. Uh, so yeah, it's hard to quantify. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you, do you have a day where you just shut everything off or are you pretty much, um, you know, thinking about it and working on it every day of the week? Cause I would imagine if you're going to events, those happen on the weekends. Um, mm. It, for yeah. consumer show events. So yeah, do, do you have a time where you turn it off and don't think about it or is it just on your mind all the time? It's on my mind all the time, <laughs> to be <laughs> honest. But I mean, I, I'll, uh, I try not to, uh, it's the, the screen. If I can stop 
looking at emails or um, communication channels, I'll um, that's to me I can start thinking about other things or doing other things or mm-hmm. you know being being with my family or um you know the, so Sundays I, I, I try not to work I generally will check my emails but so often just don't um and I try and um yeah just try and limit it to to working hours that I do do that kind of thing but when I'm designing or creating that that can happen during the at 4 a.m anytime. you know yeah at any time <laughs> that's right yeah, and it, I mean, it sounds like from what you've said previously that you've been able to strike a pretty good work-life balance, at least being able to bring your family with you. So are they um, are they active in the business side? Like, you know, when you go to events, does everybody go, or do you just kind of go and they go off and do their own thing? No, we all go. So we, we for example, we're at a Good Guys event um, in, in New York, um, and there's just the four of us, my wife and I, and the two kids, and they're playing on the trailer and mucking around and they raising it up and down and showing people and <laughs> yep. you know we're, we're just sort of enjoying time at a hot rod show really and you know we all look around the show and see that kids aren't allowed to, and so i'll go with my brother and we'll bring our sales manager over and usually we'll bring a customer or two with us that mm-hmm. that um you know that are into it and they they get to experience the, the event um i took you know two came to indy 500 we had a had a trailer on display there and and you know of course they're going to go and and they're yeah they're, they're, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they're promoting the trailer and enjoying you know part of being in the future family if you like as a customer so it's pretty cool yes yeah, so if you uh if you have any events in dallas um uh, I just let me know and I'll see if we can get some yeah. more customers out there I'm, I'm sure you don't yeah. have trouble doing it but uh just let me know <laughs> yeah um, sure so, you know, what, what may be something, you know, that you think you do differently, um, you know, that's made you successful in the business that maybe, you know, other people haven't thought about? Um, that's a hard question, really. Probably uh, I'm, not, I'm not afraid to, to travel and get, get on with things. Um, you know, I don't just I sit in the office or, you know, I, uh, get – do traditional mundane tasks day in day out i'll um i'll do what has to be done and then i'll get out there so even if it's going on a fishing trip which is unrelated to work the guys i'm with will talk about things that i can relate back to business so then you know it's it's um it's not work when you're doing something unrelated and um the opportunities arise by being out in the world um, experiencing life and you're there for it. Yeah. 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 So I'm, I'm sure plenty of people have thought about that, but it is just a case of doing it and not being afraid to, that you're going to use up all your resources because you don't, you know, it's, it's something that happens in life. You, um, there's no, there's no limit to it. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks so much. Yeah. It's, uh, being able to get out and, and, enjoy what you do is a big part of why most of us are in this industry. So it's, it's something to keep your mind on when things get, you know, a little bit hectic. Yeah. Um, so, indeed. you know, kind of, we're just going to kind of finish up here. Um, what, uh, what software programs are you using daily to kind of manage the business? I know you mentioned that you do SolidWorks for the CAD design, but there, is there any other like collaboration softwares or management softwares that you use? Uh, we don't at the moment. We we are looking at at one called Odoo, which is uh, collaborate collaborates between all the, all of the softwares that we use. So at the moment we're Zero, which is a New Zealand product for our accounting, and another product called Unleashed for our inventory control. And those two mm-hmm. talk to each other. Um, but you know, other, every day it, I'm on Safari. I'm just on on the net, and, and that's how we communicate. So. You know whether it's Skype or email or um, so. Then we've got apps we use daily. So we've got a, got a couple of apps that are that we all are on. Um, Todoist and Slack are two that we use. Yep, so that, Slack's one yeah. that I was using this morning. So I'm pretty familiar with that one as well. Yeah, yeah, that's been good. So whenever you're out in the shop, if you get to wrench on stuff anymore, um, what is your favorite tool that you get to use? The battery-powered angle grinder. 
<laughs> you can <laughs> making sparks, yeah, huh? Yeah, yeah. I still, I remember my first power tool was actually uh, an angle grinder, and um, it just changed how how it could work <laughs> as a kid. It was really dangerous, but you can you can cut and grind and shape things, and yeah, it's my favorite tool still. Yeah, that's one that I use a lot. I am a, I would be called a grinder, not a welder, um, with my lack of welding skills. So I bust out the angle grinder quite a bit, actually. <laughs> yeah. And so, um, what are you daily driving? So you said you don't have a not don't have any race cars right now. So when you're back home, what's kind of your daily commute ve vehicle? It's a uh, new Ford Ranger, which is a sort of mid-sized pickup truck, and. Uh... Yeah, so they don't. It. Is it is it one of the newer ones? Because they don't. They're releasing one in the states next year, or it may be yeah. a 2018 model. Yeah, it is a new one. So there's the um, the Chev uh, Colorado, which is the mm -hmm. same size, but the Ford version. Yeah, that's what that's what I run around in, and I love it. I have to fight with the guys at work to to keep it in the car park because they're all, <laughs> they're all, always borrowing it. And, Does it have uh, the the diesel engine in it, or is it a, a gas engine? It's a diesel. Okay. Yep. I think that, I think we're finally going to get that back in the states because the Toyota Tacoma is king right now, and it has been for a long time. And I think finally Ford's going to bring the Ranger back, and I think that's going to pique a lot of people's interest in midsize trucks, or I guess compact trucks again. Oh yeah, it's and an, it's such a great vehicle. I, I really love it. It's got huge torque it's small and it handles great it drives like a car but it's a pickup truck and yeah it just it's you know when you when you can choose just come back to that it's it's just um the way to go very cool um so yeah so how do people um you know connect with you and your company to find out more information about your products uh future is our website it's for the best way to to get hold of us um we also have a Facebook page and Instagram page, and um, if they want to know more, uh, we've got a brand new website we're launching this week, and uh, that'll have all that has all the contact details and it has four trailers on there. We've added two to the range, um, so yeah, that, that's the best way. It's futureatrailers.com. Awesome. Well, I'm definitely uh, definitely look forward to seeing um, the new stuff out at SEMA this year. So I'll be sure to come by your booth um, again and talk to you guys. But um, wanted to thank you for taking some time. I'm really glad this worked out for us. Uh, it's cool to hear about the company, you know, and how you guys are are building it and then constantly growing it. So I'm excited to see the new things that you guys come out with. Thank you very much, Todd. It's been been great talking to you. Thanks for listening to Do It for a Living. You can find out more about this guest, this show, and even details about what we just talked about at our website. Check out the Facebook page at facebook.com slash do it for a living and tell us who you want to hear from. And most importantly, subscribe to the podcast. Click subscribe. Do it now. Seriously. I'll wait while you grab your phone. Open up the podcast app. Tap the subscribe button. When you subscribe, you help us gain momentum and attract more